Thank you all for being here. My name is Holly Manier. I'm Executive Director of Special Education for Ventura County Office of Education. Nice to see some familiar faces as some of you are coming in. Um, we are here tonight with our um, Ventura County Public Health Partners, and we are here for a parent town hall where Ventura County Public Health will be presenting information. And then at the end, there will be an opportunity um, to put in chat questions if you would like. Um, most likely it will be myself or Michelle Harding, who's our special, our special education program specialist, helping with the chat. Um, we also have some of our school administrators here that I will um, introduce. So we have Stephanie Rodriguez, who is our principal at Triton Academy, sorry, Dwyer School. Um, I didn't call you Sarah though, Stephanie. That's all right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, we have Brett Taylor, who is our director of alternative education. We have Bianca Rickliffs, who has a beautiful path, a uh, garden path um, in her picture. We have Rob Sherger, who is our principal at- I know that, but you're not allowed to do that. Foster, um, sorry, I got distracted. Foster Pivik La Mariposa. And then um, Eric, uh, Eric was here, Castaniero, but I don't see him anymore. He is our assistant principal at Triton Academy. And then on behalf of Ventura County Public Health, we have Salida Dobrowski, and I'll let her share her title. Um, and then we also have Allison Harmon, and then we also have um, Aaron Slack. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Salida. I was just gonna remind everyone before, as we move forward is just please be sure you're muted. Just, it helps we get a lot of background noise otherwise. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you, Holly and Michelle, right. for having to us tonight. You're unmuted. How do I get muted? All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Salida Dabrowski, and I'm the Infectious Disease Prevention Administrator for Ventura County Public Health. And I'm um, pleased to also have Allison Harmon here tonight. She is the Medical Therapy Program Manager. And then also Erin Slack, who is our um, epi one of our epidemiologists with Ventura County Public Health. And then I also see Dr. Minako Watavi, um, who is one of our healthcare agency physicians. And she's been popping on just to um, uh, answer questions as well and kind of jump in from the physician perspective. So I'm glad I just saw her pop on too. So what we're going to do tonight is we are going to share some data with you, our current Ventura County data, what it looks like for this tiered system um, and the direction that we're moving as a county, what all of that means. And then we're going to also share some information with you just about COVID-19 in general uh, and what our partnership has been with the schools and what that looks like. And then we're going to go over some of our frequently asked questions. So we know that we're not going to answer every single question that you might have, but we're going to do our best to get through some of the more common ones. Um, and then hopefully, um, hopefully you'll walk away from this feeling much more educated and informed about COVID-19 in Ventura County. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin so she can do her data presentation for you. Hi everybody, my name is Erin Slack and I'm the Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Epidemiologist here at Public Health. Can you hear me okay? I can't tell if I'm unmuted. I'm on the phone and on the computer. <laughs> You're good, Erin. Um, really quick, Holly, I don't have the access to share my screen this time. Very sorry, I will fix so that. As, as Salita is bringing up the slides, um, I'll share, um, again, I'm the Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Epidemiologist. However, for the last six months, I've been redeployed to the COVID surveillance response. So if any of you get the daily report from our public information officer, Ashley Bautista, then you are familiar with the information and the data that we have been analyzing for a while. It was every day. Um, now we do reports. Uh, Monday through Friday only and not on holidays. But what I'm going to do today is share some information with you on our current metrics and case rate and trends over time. And I'm really excited to be able to present this information to you. If you go to vcrecovers.org, which is our 
Ventura County website related to our COVID response, you will be able to get access to the information from the surveillance report that's put out again on Monday through Friday every week and has the most recent data available for Ventura County. And if you're looking for Ventura County specific data, it's best to go directly to our website because our source of data is the most accurate for our county in, in terms of the most recent and available data for Ventura County. So this slide that you see here, this is from our Power BI dashboard that we have on bcrecovers.org. And one of the things that I always say about COVID is that the only thing constant with COVID-19 is change. And we've really learned that um, throughout this entire pandemic in public health. And so at first, when the County of Ventura started opening up after the initial stay well at home order was put in place in March, we filed an attestation with the State Department of Public Health to move through the stages of reopening at an accelerated pace. And in order to do this, we had to adhere by county data monitoring metrics. And initially, there were six county data monitoring metrics. That included a 14-day average case rate, a seven-day testing positivity rate, our testing volume and capacity, our percent ICU bed capacity, our percent ventilator capacity, and then our change in three-day average hospitalizations. We first became on the monitoring list in Ventura County in mid-June because of an increase in our hospitalization after we started reopening. And then subsequently we became on the monitoring list. We were off the monitoring list for our hospitalization and we became on the monitoring list for our 14 day average case rate. So about five weeks ago, the California Department of Public Health and the governor's office decided to change the monitoring metrics and come out with a new system called the blueprint for a healthier economy and or a safer economy, I'm sorry. And that blueprint involved a tiered system and monitoring metrics. And so instead of a 14 day average case rate that we had to adhere to with a threshold of 100, they changed it to a single day case rate, which was a seven day average with a seven day delay. And basically what they did is they took that 100 threshold that we had previously, they divided by 14 and got 7.14. And so the seven became the threshold for, from moving to the most restrictive tier, which was purple, to the second most restrictive tier, which is red. And the reason that that's important for all of us on the call is that while counties were in the most restrictive tier, the purple tier, schools could only open for in-person instruction under a waiver process for K through six schools. Now that we've officially moved to the red tier, all schools K through 12 are allowed to reopen for in-person instruction following CDPH and BCPH guidelines. And so right now, um, the new tiered system, we, when it was initially launched, we were being monitored for our case rate and then our positivity rate. And then about two weeks ago, they established an additional metric, which was a health equity metric, which I will go into detail about in subsequent slides. But the takeaway from this slide is we in Ventura County are meeting the goals for all of our original county data monitoring metrics that we first had to adhere to. And then we're also progressing through the tiered system as well. Right now, our case rate is 5.1, which the most recent measurement period came out on Tuesday, and that puts us in the red tier for our case rate. Our positivity rate is at 2.4%, which actually puts us in the orange tier, which is the third tier, so it's a less restrictive tier than we're in. The way that it works with the tiered system is that you have to stay in the most restrictive tier of your monitoring metrics. So if your case rate's in a higher tier, you must stay in that higher tier. So for right now, we're still in the red tier for our case rate. So we must stay there, even though our positivity rate is meeting the metrics for the orange tier. We're actually getting pretty close to the yellow for our positivity because that's less than 2%. And then the health equity metric in our most recent measurement period was at 3.1%. And again, this is a positivity rate and I'll go into more detail on a further slide. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Selena. So as I said, this is the new blueprint for a safer economy. And 
this shows where other counties in Southern California are in terms of the tiers and compares our case rate, positivity rate, and lower HPI quartile rate to other counties. But what I want to share with you here is that really when we look at case rates, they're very much a function of how many people you're testing in a community. The more people that you're testing, the more people that you're going to identify with COVID-19. Now, it is indicative of transmission in a community, but really the positivity rate is a better indicator of transmission in a community because the positivity rate is stable over time in terms of how many people are positive over how many people you're testing, whereas the case rate is solely a function of how many people that you're testing. And so you can see here, Ventura County in comparison to other counties, we actually have a really high testing rate um, the state median rate for testing within a community is 239 tests per 100,000 population per day over a seven day period. And so we're well above the state median average. What happened was when the tiered system first came out is some communities in Southern California and other areas as well started reducing their testing capacity in an effort to actually reduce their case rate to move through the tiered system at an accelerated pace. And the state became aware of this tactic. And so they decided to do a case rate adjustment based upon a county's testing rate. So if your testing rate is above the state meeting average, you get a positive adjustment on your case rate. So that means that your case rate actually will be lower than its true rate because you're testing more people. Because they realize that the more people you test, the higher your case rate's going to be. Now, if your testing rate is below the state median average, they actually do a negative adjustment to your case rate. So for instance, in Riverside, you see their testing volume is lower than the state median average. So their overall case rate is at 7.1, but they get adjusted to a higher rate because they're not testing as many people as they should be within their community, according to the State Department of Public Health. And another thing I wanna share here is if you look at the lower HPI quartile, which again, I'll go into detail about, we actually have the lowest percentage of all of the counties in Southern California. And you'll see why this is important um, on the next slide. And then our overall positivity rate is the lowest other than, than Santa Barbara, which is an indication of lower transmission within our community. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Selena. So the health equity metric was put in place about two weeks ago. And one of the reasons that the California Department of Public Health decided to embrace the health equity metric is because low income, and this is true in Ventura County, California, and also throughout the United States, but low income, Black, Latino, Pacific Islander, and essential workers have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And what you see in most counties there are differences between testing positivity between our more affluent neighborhoods and our less affluent neighborhoods. And this is also true in Ventura County. And so what the State Department of Public Health decided to do was they collaborated with the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. And this is a consortium of health departments in Southern California of which Ventura County Public Health is a member. And they have a metric called the Healthy Places Index. And if you Google Healthy Places Index, you'll find their map and you'll be able to see all of the data. But this Healthy Places Index is basically an aggregate of a whole bunch of social determinants of health information. So it looks at census tracts within our community and it pulls data on educational attainment, median housing prices, housing overcrowding, indicators that really are social determinants of health that affect health and wellness across the lifespan. And they take all that data for each of the census tracts and they aggregate it into a sim single index score of zero to 100. If your census tract has a score closer to zero, that means that your community has less than ideal healthy community conditions. If your census tract is closer to 100, that means that your community has more ideal healthy community conditions. And so what they did was they took all of the scores for all of our census tracts within Ventura County and they put them in order from zero to 100. And the bottom 25% of those census tracts that had the lowest score are put in a bin 
And then the 25 to 50% are put into another bin and then 50 to 75% are put into another bin and then 75 to 100 are put into another bin. So that lowest quartile, that bin number one, those are our most disadvantaged communities according to the Healthy Places Index. And so what the State Department of Public Health decided to do was to develop a positivity rate just for those communities. And in order for a county to move through the, to the next tier, the positivity rate for that lower HPI quartile also had to meet the restrictions for that tier. So in Ventura County, if you look here, you'll see the dark kind of bluish line. That's the Healthy Places Index lower quartile positivity rate. And the jagged black line is the positivity rate for the County of Ventura overall. And what they really want to see is that there's not a huge disparity between the lower HPI quartile rate and the overall county rate. And you see over time, we've actually lessened the disparity in terms of our lower HPI quartile and the overall county rate. But in order to move from the most restricted tier, which is the purple tier, into the red tier, both of these lines had to be below the purple line that you see here. In order to move from the red tier to the orange tier, both of the metrics have to be below the red line. And then in order to move to the least restrictive tier, both of the metrics actually have to be below the orange line. So you'll see over time, we've seen significant improvement in our lower HPI quartile positivity rate, as well as our overall county rate. But most importantly, the gap between the two rates has also lessened over time. So in addition to having to meet that metric, counties also must submit a plan to show how the county intends to invest in these communities. And thankfully for Ventura County, we, this is what public health does. We always identify vulnerable populations and work with those communities to implement strategies to try to reduce health disparities in those communities. So our health education team has been on the ground in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID doing health education. Our COVID compliance department has been working with essential businesses in these communities to ensure that they're adhering to CDPH industry guidance. We've even at Ventura County Public Health through some enhancing laboratory and epidemiologic capacity set aside funding for school districts that are part of the Ventura County Business Services Authority, which have students in these lower HPI quartile census tracts, to provide them with $260,000 in funding to be able to buy infection prevention supplies in order to support them coming back to in-person instruction. And then the reason that this is so important is that one of the things that we've seen, and last week I was on a call with the maternal child and adolescent health directors. And there was a researcher there from UC San Francisco that talked about that they had done some surveys of students from March through May when distance learning became into effect. And they found that 38.4% of students that were of lower socioeconomic status were not engaging in distance learning at all, compared to 4% of students of higher socioeconomic status. So not only is COVID disproportionately impacting these communities in terms of infection rates, but it's creating bigger gaps in terms of educational achievement within our community. And that's not what we want to see in public health because education plays such a huge role in health and wellness across the lifespan. So if you want to go to the next slide, Salida. So I don't think most people know what census tract that they live in. So it's really hard to tell you, oh, well, this this census tract is in the lower healthy places index quartile. So what we did on this map is we overlaid the communities that are part of the lower HPI quartile, which are the darker blue that you see there with the zip codes. So you can see where they're spread throughout our community. And the positivity rate is just an aggregate of the total people that are positive in those communities over the total people that are tested in those communities. And so you'll see it's the Oxnard, South Oxnard, Port Wyneme area, the west end of Ventura County, the Santa Clara Valley area. We have a census tract in Moore Park and also in Simi Valley. So it's kind of spread all throughout the community, but this metric is based on those census tracts that you see here. Do you want to go to the next slide, Salida? 
Okay, so this is a pretty busy slide, but what we've decided to do in Ventura County to try to help look at a community level where we are with the tiered monitoring system is on a weekly basis when the state monitoring metrics come out for our county as a whole, we're also putting out monitoring metrics by zip code. And you'll see here, the most recent measurement period was week ending October 10th. Normally what I do during these presentations is provide a little bit more context for the community in which you're living. I know with this, we have people from all over Ventura County. Um, so you can kind of look for your community and see where your rate is. But so the purple tier is the most restricted tier, which we were in um, about three weeks ago. That's a positivity rate above 8% and a case rate above seven. The red tier, which is the second highest tier, is a positivity rate um, of between having a hard time seeing people in the chat is coming up between five and seven point nine and a case rate between four and six point nine. And then the third highest risk tier, which is a positivity rate between two and four point nine and a case rate between one and three point nine is the orange. So as I said before, we're in the red tier for our case rate, but we're actually in the orange tier for our positivity rate here in Ventura County. And then the lowest risk tier is a positivity rate less than 2% and a case rate of less than one new case per 100,000. And so you can see there's some communities that have disproportionately high case rates. And you see here for the most recent measurement period, it's the Fillmore, Oxnard, Santa Paula and Simi Valley area. And so these, these places correspond with those lower healthy places index quartiles that are disproportionately impacted by COVID. But what I will say is over time, Ventura County, and you'll see our overall trends have significantly improved over time. And even though these communities still have elevated rates in comparison with the county rate, their rates in comparison with where they were in July have dramatically decreased over time. And um, so if you wanna look at your community metrics, you'll see the case rate. The first two um, columns there are the case rate for the most recent measurement period, which was October 10th, and then the previous week, which is October 3rd. And then the positivity rates again, October 10th was the most recent, and then October 3rd was the previous measurement period. When we start breaking down the case rates by these small communities, the rates are actually really variable from week to week. And just a few cases in a community can put you over the threshold for the next tier. During this measurement period, we only had 350 cases in all of Ventura County. And so when you start to break down those 350 cases into the communities, there can be a lot of variability with these smaller populations. And so what we're doing on a weekly basis is we're also providing information on if there was an outbreak in a long-term care facility or a congregate living situation in that community that may have affected the case rate. A few weeks ago, the 93003 zip code had an elevated case rate in the purple tier, and we had an outbreak at a main jail and a congregate living situation, a skilled nursing facility that really caused an elevation in that case rate. So we make a note to let you know if that's what's causing an increase within the community. For all of Ventura County, in order for us to move from the purple tier, which was the most restrictive to the red, we had to report less than 60 cases per day in our total population of 853,000. In order for us to move to the next tier, so from red to orange, we need to get below 34 cases per day in our population of 853,000. And so we're we're right about 47, 48 right now. So we're getting closer, but we still have some work to do to get to the orange tier. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Salida. So this shows our daily case rate per 100,000 population for Ventura County from June 1st to October 10th. So you'll see as we started opening back up in early June, that's when our case rate started increasing. This is also when we started increasing our testing capacity as well and started opening up testing to asymptomatic individuals. But then we had a little bit of a dip in our um, case rate in late June. And then about two weeks after the 4th of July holiday weekend, we had an increase in our cases, a sustained increase for a few weeks. 
And this is the time when the governor decided to close schools for in-person instruction for any county that had gone above the case rate threshold of 100. And Ventura County was one of those counties. And when the governor did this, I believe it was the week of July 13th, um, he had allowed for elementary schools to apply for a waiver for K through six instruction. But our health officer, Dr. Levin, took a more slow and thoughtful approach because he felt like community transmission was at a level that he wasn't quite sure it was safe to reopen all schools for in-person instructors, even through a waiver process. And so he actually didn't allow schools to submit a waiver until August 19th, when we had seen a few incubation periods of decreased transmission in our community. And you'll see since then, we have had decreased transmission. We're expecting um, our case rate right now, it's showing as of October 13th, we're at 4.7. So we have, we're still seeing even a reduction since we had in the most recent measurement period. And even if I think we did another presentation yesterday to DCOE, and I think my number is even lower than what I reported yesterday. So we are on the decline. We still expect that this next week, we are not going to meet the metrics for the orange tier. We'll still meet the metrics for the case rate in the red tier. So if you want to go to the next slide, Salida. So this is our testing positivity rate over time for the entire county. It really follows the trend line for the case rate. See the same dip that we see um, in late June. Our testing positivity rate has actually always been below the, the threshold of 8%, except for just a couple times um, in June and July, and has been decreasing over time. Again, the testing positivity rate is just the total number of positive tests over the total number of people tested within our community. So um, it's less a function of how many people that you're testing whereas the case rate is very much a function of how many people that you're testing. So if you go to the next slide, Salida. So this is a daily number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients in past three-day average. And you'll see the trend line for our hospitalizations follows the case rate. Um, as more people become infected with COVID-19, you're going to have more people that are hospitalized with COVID-19 because a certain percentage of people just require acute care in order to deal with the symptoms that are associated with COVID-19. And so we saw our spike on um, our peak in terms of hospitalizations over 100 on July 18th. And then we've been declining since then. And we're actually getting back to our kind of stay well at home order, um, pre-opening of the county numbers within our facilities here in Ventura County. And what I will say is that part of the reason that the stay well at home order was first enacted was to allow the hospitals time to plan for a surge capacity. And our hospitals really have risen to that challenge. And they worked with our emergency medical services department and they all have surge plans in place that they haven't had to actually see come to fruition. But um, we, beyond the hospital walls, have a surge capacity of over 800 additional beds that can be um, utilized in the event of a surge within our community. And so our hospitals have had time and have taken the time to really prepare for any surge that might come to Ventura County. So if you want to go to the next slide, Salida. So these are our case metrics as of 1022. Um, what we're really seeing um, in our county, when we talk about new cases, I, I don't normally say this, but I think that it's an important kind of thing because I talked about, well, we've got 60 cases, we have to be below 60 to be in the red tier and 34. When we talk about new cases that are reported, these are cases that are reported over a long period of time. And um, so today, about 17% of our cases are more than a week old. Some of them are a couple months old. Um, we're starting to get some older reports that never came in. I'm not sure why they never um, came in, but those are included in our case rate. But what we're also seeing is much more timely reporting. So 38, case, 38 of the cases that we reported today actually had their labs collected on Tuesday. And so for us to already have that information and be reporting out on that, that's not what used to happen um, <laughs> in the early parts of the pandemic. Sometimes we'd be waiting seven or 10 days to even get the, the lab collection or get the labs to us. 
And so what that allows us to do is really much more timely case investigation and contact tracing. And I think that's what's significantly contributing to our lower transmission here in Ventura County because we're getting the reports in a much more timely fashion. We're able to initiate that case investigation and contact tracing so that we can ensure that people are safely isolating and quarantining. The other thing I'll share is that of our active cases that we have, in total in Ventura County, there's only 530 that are currently active cases that are under isolation. So we've reported a cumulative number of total cases over time. I'm not sure when we're gonna start the tickler over to zero again. It might be at the beginning of the year, but right now we only have 530 total active cases. And in all of our eight hospitals within Ventura County, we only have 31 that are currently hospitalized with COVID-19. And one thing that we're going to be doing very soon is implementing an automated system for contact tracing in our community to try to ensure that we have even more timely um, contact tracing initiated. And that's through a company called Qualtrics. And this company has been working with Brown University on a study of schools um, all throughout the United States with over 200,000 children in over 48, in 47 states within the United States in the last two weeks of September. And what they found from their initial study is that the infection rate among students is only 1.13%. And what that equates to in a school of 1,000 kids is 1.3 infections over a two-week period in those 1,000 kids. And among staff, they've seen the infection rate to be 0.22%, which equates to 2.2 infections in a staff of 1,000 staff members. And so what we're seeing is that if community transmission is low and CDPH guidelines and BCPH guidelines are followed, similar to the guidelines for essential workers within our community, then it is a safe environment to bring kids back to in-person instruction. And so we're here to provide you with the most relevant data and information on the guidance that's available and the collaboration that we've had with the schools so far um, to be able to support that reopening process so that we can allow for more in-person instruction within our communities because we know that our kiddos need it so much. And so I'll turn it over to Salida. I um, actually do have to jump off the call because I have to jump onto a parent call for my own student that is going to go into hybrid instruction. So if there's any data-related questions, um, Salida can most likely answer them because she's heard my spiel a million times. Um, but if not, we can get back to Holly and make sure that those in, that information is distributed to you as well. Thank you so much, Erin. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to switch gears. It looks like I'm, I'm seeing just some of the chat. I can't see it when, um, when I'm sharing my screen. Uh, Alita, most of the questions are related to um, reopening dates, so I'm I'm responding in chat, and I'm also sharing some new um, in-person learning resources that are in our plan. I just shared those in chat. Great, thank you so much, Holly. Um, we know everybody's very anxious um, to get their kids back to school or to know what that's going to look like. Um, I'm in the same boat. I'm a parent. Aaron's a parent. Allison's a parent. Dr. Watabi is a parent and you know we are all anxious to find out what that looks like for our kids getting back to school. Um, I have a high schooler and unfortunately he will not be going back for any in-person instruction until January, um, which is hard. It, you know that's it's hard. And so we understand um, the anxiety around getting schools opened, um, the uncertainty. And so I want to be able to answer some of the, the questions, the common questions that we get. Um, I'm going to go through these slides quickly because I want to be able to, you know, hopefully answer some of the health related questions. Um, so we do just do a quick little overview of what COVID-19 is, that it is a new virus. It's what's causing this current pandemic. And I want to talk a little bit about how it does spread. It does spread mainly from person to person through respiratory droplets. That is the main cause of how it spreads. There's some limiting knowledge about uh, whether or not it's spread from surfaces. Um, and so important, you know, it is still important to clean surfaces frequently, um, especially ones that are high touch areas. Um, but really it is spread between people that are in close contact with one another from respiratory droplets. 
signs and symptoms, you know, as Aaron mentioned, the only constant has been change with this. And we've learned so much about this virus since, you know, earlier this year. And one of the things that's very interesting about this virus is it has a really long incubation period. It's anywhere from two to 14 days. So it can take up to 14 days for, for symptoms to show up in somebody that's been infected with COVID-19. And at the very beginning, the kind of hallmark symptoms were fever, cough, shortness of breath. Those were the three symptoms that were very telltale that a person had COVID-19. Since then, we've learned that there's a, a whole slew of other symptoms that accompany this virus from fatigue and body aches, sore throat, congestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then another telltale sign is new loss of taste or smell. So that's something else that's really um, kind of popped up for um, being a hallmark symptom of COVID-19. So we've put out a student symptom decision tree really to help the schools in identifying kids when they need to go home, um, when they should be recommended for testing for COVID-19. And so this is just a snapshot of the top part of that tool. It's available on our BC Recovers, our Ventura County Recovers.org website under school information, just if you're interested in seeing it for yourself. Um, Again, those high risk red flag symptoms of fever, cough, difficulty breathing and loss of taste or smell. And one of the other things I also wanted to point out is some information that's come out from the CDC and I'm going to read this. I don't typically read slides. I'm going to read it. I think it's important and I know that there's some people that are on the phone that maybe can't see slides. Um, what the CDC has said is that scientific studies suggest that COVID-19 transmission among children in schools may be low. International studies that have assessed how readily COVID-19 spreads in schools also reveal low rates of transmission when community transmission is low, as it is here in Ventura County. Based on current data, the rate of infection among younger school children and from students to teachers has been low, especially if proper precautions are followed. There have also been few reports of children being the primary source of COVID-19 transmission among family members. This is consistent with data from both virus and antibody testing, suggesting that children are not the primary drivers of COVID-19 spread in schools or in the community. No studies are conclusive, but the available evidence provides reason to believe that in-person schooling is in the best interest of students, particularly in the context of appropriate mitigation measures similar to those implemented in essential workplaces. So as we've mentioned, we know how important it is to get our kids back to school safely in an in-person instruction environment. And so we've been working with the schools since back in May to ensure that that could happen. We knew that we knew that school was going to look different in the fall, um, given what the trends were of COVID-19. So we've worked very closely with BCOE and with the school districts, as well as with our private schools in the community to ensure that when an in-person instruction resumed, that it would be in a, the safest environment possible. As I'm sure you're all aware, our kind of top three prevention um, methods of COVID-19, good hand hygiene. We teach our kids this from a very young age to wash their hands after they go to the restroom, to wash their hands before and after they eat. Um, and, you know, I think that if we've learned anything from COVID-19, I hope that it's to wash our hands more frequently even now. We do know that hand washing works. It breaks that outer layer of the virus and prevents cross transmission. Face coverings, this is another prevention measure to uh, mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Wearing a mask or a cloth, cloth face covering can slow that spread by limiting the release of the virus into the air. It's important that it's a properly fitting mask and that it's a proper um, material mask. And we really want um, those masks to have two or more layers to really stop that droplet spread. And then also ensuring that the mask is over your nose, over your mouth um, and under your chin to really ensure that those droplets aren't getting out um, from your mouth or nose. And then social distancing as well. We know that respiratory droplets are produced when someone coughs, sneezes, or talks, and it really can be spread within close contact, so within that six feet mark, and cause somebody to um, contract COVID-19. Uh, it's not as common for asymptomatic people to spread the, the virus, but it can happen. So again, in public health with prevention being um, you know, our line of business, we really want to 
you know, re, we really want to reiterate the importance of these three things um, in stopping the spread of germs in general, but especially of COVID-19. So I want to share with you, because we've done all this work with the schools, um, what we've done with the schools is help them figure out how they would um, be able to adhere to CDPH guidelines and CDC guidelines for safe reopening of schools. We developed a team of liaisons to work with them. We've asked them to develop a team of liaisons to work with us. They've submitted reopening plans to BCOE, um, to their health department, so that they could look at those plans and ensure that all of those guidelines were being followed. And then we provide additional support for the schools as well when they have questions. As guidance and things change, then we're trying to help them to stay on top of it. So some of the things that are key in the school reopening plans that are really important are things like active or passive screening of all students and staff. Um, we have a temperature threshold of less than 99.5. Uh, CDPH has 100.4. We actually have it a tiny bit lower than that. We really feel that 99.5 is more indicative of somebody that has a fever. The um, requirement of face coverings in, uh, especially with school staff and then with students as they are able, social distancing, really utilizing our outdoor spaces that we have on campus as much as possible, and then contact tracing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So with the contact tracing piece, when you know when a student's in school, um, the school is really the one that knows who a child or a teacher or a staff member has been in contact while they're on campus. So what we do is we've enlisted the help of the schools um, in contact tracing to help us identify if there's somebody that's been positive on campus, who was that person in contact with while on school campus. That helps us to be able to um, to ask those people to quarantine um, for their quarantine period and so that we can really stop the spread as quickly as possible. We conduct contact tracing for um, contacts that are outside of the school campus. So if, if it's a student that's positive, we work with that family to identify who else they may have been in contact with off the school campus site. And then we have a really strong streamlined communication process with our school liaisons, especially um, in the event of a positive case or an exposure. So our school liaisons, um, each school district has identified at least two to work with us and their role is to monitor absenteeism of staff and students as needed to identify any potential trends to assist us, as I said, with contact tracing and also to provide communication out to families and staff. We wanna make sure that, that families and staff are getting up to date, current, accurate information from us in public health, and that we are receiving the accurate and um, up to date information from the schools as well. So we want that information to go out to families and staff as quickly and streamlined as possible. And that's why that's part of the role of the school liaisons. And then also again, that collaboration with our public health team. All right, so with that being said, I am going to just go over a couple of um, the areas, well, several areas that we get a lot of questions in. Holly, any questions so far that you think that um, would be? They're, they're much more, uh, they're much more site specific or school specific than VCPH specific, but I'll keep you posted, Selena. Sounds good. Okay. So I do want to say one of the things that we get asked frequently is in the event that Ventura County goes back to the purple tier, um, we are crossing fingers, knocking on wood, doing all the things that we need to do to hopefully, um, hopefully not see that happen here in Ventura County. But in the event that we move back to a more restrictive tier, schools do not have to close. They K through 12 schools can remain open. What would close a school is if a school is experiencing a widespread outbreak. We have a really low threshold for what we are considering an outbreak with schools in that we want a school to notify us of one positive. If it's a staff person, a student, whatever. We want them to notify us because we want to get on top of that as quickly as possible. An outbreak is identified as three or more cases that are related to one another. So as far as opening and closing schools, the state has put out um, things for individual school closure. 
is really recommended based on the number of cases and the percentage of teachers, students, and staff that are positive for COVID-19, and also con after consultation with our public health officer. Individual school closure may be appropriate when there's multiple cases in multiple cohorts at a school, or if there's at least 5% of the total number of teachers, students, and staff that become positive within a 14 day period. And it really depends on the size and the layout of the school as well. And so we will work um, specifically with a school site in the event that they experience an outbreak. I am happy to say that as of right now, so we've had private schools that have been open for well over two months, going on three months at this point, and we haven't had any outbreaks in any of our private schools. In fact, we haven't even had any positive cases in our private schools. So that is really reassuring because we've had so many of them go back. The difference between our private schools and our public schools, obviously the number, there's far fewer students at a, at a private school. They have a lot more resources. They tend to have um, smaller class sizes as well. So a lot of the schools have opened back up full capacity, whereas our public schools probably won't be able to open up full capacity due to the social distancing requirements that CDPH has for us. Some of the other questions that people ask have to do with routine screening and testing as far as- Lita, can I ask you a quick question? Um, you said that no one in the private schools has been diagnosed with, I'm just, uh, with COVID-19, I was wondering if anybody in any public schools has been. Um, as far as related to, um, related to the school, no. We have community transmission. Um, so, you know, we've, we, that's, about all I can say about that. We have community transmission. We have not had any school related cases. So nothing like at a nexus of a school where yes. there's been an outbreak. Thank you so much for answering that question. Yes, yes correct. And we're definitely um, keeping a very, very close eye on that. And we will continue to keep a close eye on that. So routine testing and screening, a lot of people do ask about that. There is no requirement for students to be routinely tested. Um, for staff and teachers, they, uh, CDPH right now is saying that staff, teachers, um, and other uh, school employees should be tested on a rotating basis every two months. So we have our testing sites available. We have plenty of capacity for them to go to those sites to get tested. Um, and so that's not a problem with our, um, with our testing capacity or anything like that. Um, so that's open for them. And, and, you know, that testing requirement may change over time. We don't know, but that's what the testing requirement is right now from CDPH. That's what they say. Let's see. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of definitions and um, hopefully this will help as well. We get a lot of questions about what is a close contact. Um, there's been some confusion since yesterday because CDC actually came out with an um, a new definition for close contact. What's really great about California and about Ventura County is California has already had this definition of a close contact that's a little bit different than what CDC was saying. And so we've already been following it, especially for our schools. The definition of a close contact is being um, within six feet of somebody with COVID for 15 minutes or longer, whether it's cumulative or all at once. Um, within a 24 hour period. So we would consider somebody that was within six feet for longer than um, 15 minutes to be a close contact of somebody with COVID-19. So as we keep social distancing measures in place and masks as much as possible, then we don't necessarily see if there's a positive case in a classroom that the entire classroom would have to quarantine. Um, in fact, the goal would be that they wouldn't have to quarantine as long as social distancing measures, cleaning, hand washing, and all of that was in place. So that's a little bit different. It's caused some confusion since yesterday because CDC came out. CDPH, I think, said, yeah, we've already had that definition in place. And that's the definition that we follow here in Ventura County already anyway. Another question has to do with quarantine. With that 14-day quarantine period um, and why. Why can't somebody just go get a test? And if it's negative, that they can go back to work or go back to school. And the reason why is because COVID-19 has that really long incubation period, like I mentioned. So you could, if you found out you were exposed to somebody three days ago, you could go in and get a test and it could be negative today, but then maybe in two or three days it would turn positive. 
so because we don't know when a person will um, their when the viral load will be high enough in their body to be positive, we ask people to quarantine for that full 14 days just to make sure that they are not going to turn positive for COVID-19. So there is that 14 day uh, quarantine period. During that time, if it is a student, they should have access to distance learning at any of the schools that should be made available to them during their quarantine period. And then for staff, hopefully arrangements are, are made with the school. I can't speak to that specifically. That's definitely a human resources question for the schools. But if for the student piece, they will have access to distance learning. And then for isolation, if somebody has COVID-19, they need to isolate for a minimum of 10 days and be fever free for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medication and have an improvement in their symptoms. So those three things have to be in place in order for them to be considered cleared of COVID-19. So something else that's a little bit interesting with this virus is that somebody can actually test positive for months after their infection. It doesn't mean that they're contagious, it just means that their body's kind of hanging on to that virus um, in, in their system. So we moved away from a test-based strategy where we required a negative test to clear them um, to that 10 days fever-free improvement in symptoms. Let's see, um, we've covered that. Masks, uh, so this is something else that is, um, chall it's challenging for this population of students, for some of these students. So masks are required for third grade and up. That, that's a CDPH requirement and there's some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, uh, masks are required for children that are in grades three and up. And then obviously any adults and any staff. Grades kinder through second, it is strongly encouraged. Um, and that's what CDPH says. They would strongly encourage kids in pre-K through second grade to wear a mask. It's up to a school to require those grades to, um, to wear a mask. And a lot of the schools are doing that, um, which we fully support. So a lot of the schools are, are requiring their, their younger kids to also wear masks as well. There are exceptions to the mask requirements. And there's, a, there's truthfully, there, in the general population, there's very few people that would qualify for a mask exemption. In this population of students, there's gonna be far more students that qualify for a mask exemption. So one of the things that we're working really closely with Holly and Michelle on is what does that look like? So given that most of these classes, the class sizes are small, that is huge and that plays a really important role in ensuring that we can try to minimize any um, any spread in that population. So there are alternatives to wearing face masks. Some kids cannot wear them for a variety of reasons. Face shields are also an option for that population and social distancing is important. We also know that there are kids that struggle with social distancing. Um, and so it's gonna, you know, it, it's gonna come down to really working with the child as much as possible, but then to also work with the staff too, um, to ensure that kids can stay as far apart as possible um, for as much of time, as much of the time as possible. So uh, face shields in addition to masks, I just see that. We certainly want that for the staff that are working with these students. Um, we think that having that additional, the, the protection over the eyes um, in addition to the face mask, face mask is gonna be really important, especially if the child cannot wear a mask or if you're providing hands-on care um, or direct contact care with a child. So we really wanna ensure that our, the staff are following the guidelines um, related to PPE for sure. Uh, let's see, I think that covers a lot of, we've got about four minutes left. I feel like this hour flew by. Um, like I said, I know that um, we have not answered, we haven't scratched the surface of questions that you probably have. Just know that we're working really closely with Holly and Michelle and their team um, to make sure that your students are safe when they go back to school. In reality, there are students that probably going back to in-person instruction is not gonna be feasible um, given whatever their health condition might be. And I would encourage you to work with their provider, work with their healthcare provider to determine, is it safe for your child to go back to in-person instruction right now? Um, if it is, what does that look like? 
their medical provider is going to be the, the best person to, um, you know, to help you with that. And let's see. Felita, I think there's a good question about um, Mr. Mark says his son is autistic and has behavior. How can teachers and school staff keep him safe to stop behaviors if they have to follow the close contact rules? So I think, um, you know, that that's always like a Watabi, by the way, she's, uh, this is Dr. Watabi. She's a physician with Ventura County. Sorry. Yes, I should have said, I, uh, I should have introduced myself, but yeah, I, I know that um, sometimes it's particularly difficult with either young children or children with special needs to maintain social distancing because the children just need so much contact. Um, and that's what we're used to doing in order to, to care for them. And that happens in the hospital setting as well. Of course, we, um, you know, if we're, we're sitting across from somebody, we try to sit a little bit further apart, but we often have to get closer to the patients or, you know, to students um, in your case. And um, we have to take the precautions that we can. So as far as if you're within six feet, that close contact rule has to do with two people not having masks on. So that only applies if the child can't wear a mask and the teacher's also not wearing a mask. Or if the child can't wear a mask, if the child is wear not wearing a mask and the teacher's wearing a mask and a face shield, then that's very protective. Um, that kind of adds a second layer of protection for the teacher for, ch for who may be around children who would have to be closer than six feet and also may have a hard time keeping their mask on or wearing it properly. Um, so there are strategies for the adult to be able to, for them to take in order to, to minimize the risk of transmission to them and therefore reducing the risk that they'll transmit to others. And it's the same with contact. You know, I think, you know, there's inevitably teachers will have to touch students, you know, if they're, if they're in danger or, um, you know, need to help them in any way. And they can certainly do that. It's just about hand hygiene before and after. And so these are all kind of just safety guidelines um, and, you know, are helpful and not a hundred percent, but there definitely are strategies even for, for children who, who may need closer contact. Thank you so much, Dr. Watabi for that. Um, one of the things too is, uh, you know, Allison Harmon as the medical therapy program manager, so all the medical therapy units um, that we have throughout Ventura County, they've actually been back providing services for their kids since May, June, um, that we were able to start seeing kids in clinic and they've steadily incre increased that over the months. And so granted, I know it's not a classroom setting, they can only have a couple of kids in the therapy unit at a time. Most of their kids um, are unable to wear masks. And so we've been able to implement strategies to keep the, the staff and the kids safe where we haven't had any, um, any positives or any outbreaks in our therapy units either as far as that goes. So um, there are definitely strategies, like I said, um, for your child specifically, um, please work with your medical provider on what's best for them, given their health condition. We feel very confident um, in public health that we can get students back to in-person learning in a safe environment. Um, we feel that we can mitigate outbreaks as quickly as possible, hopefully preventing them in our schools. That is our goal. And that's why we're working really closely with VCOE and all of the different schools throughout our community. Um, so thank you for the great questions. I hope that this was helpful for all of you. Um, if you still have additional questions that maybe are public health related, please reach out to Holly and Michelle. They'll get those to us. Um, they're going to be the experts on school site plans um, and, and safe reopening for them. So thank you guys so much for attending tonight. Have a wonderful evening and uh, take care. Thank you, Slada. I was just going to mention a couple more things. Um, one is that we will be sending out tomorrow some frequently asked questions, um, some information to our families, and there'll also be an update. Uh, we'll start. We're starting weekly updates related to our plans and some changes, recent changes that we made to our reopening plans, and also those site plans that I uh, referenced earlier. So thank you again for everyone for attending, and thank you to VCPH. Salida and Dr. Watabi and Allison for being here. Appreciate it. And Erin, although she's she's gone. Appreciate everyone's attendance tonight.